you should probably expect spoilers. This girl's got 128 bits and old school connections whenever she starts dialing up that modem. Who that? It's Dreamcast! Around this time last year during 2014, a little cartoon show aired in Japan. What was this show? Sega Hard Girls. And before you cheeky Nando motherfuckers at the back start laughing your ass off at the dodgy sounding title, I got two things for ya. Firstly, it's Sega Hard Girls because the word hard is short for hardware. You know, like computer consoles? Hardware? It's not a sex joke is what I'm saying, though it totally should be. Secondly, Sega Hard Girls is really the collective title for the girls themselves and not the actual name of the anime show. The anime show is called, um, any one of these, because for some reason Sega really wanted to make things difficult here. But basically, whether it's the anime or the girls appearing in some random video game, the characters are collectively known as the Sega Hard Girls, and that's what I'm going to be referring to them as from here on out, because I'm not going to sit here and say high school Sega Gaga every time. You're mad. It was a very, very short series consisting of only 13 episodes, with each episode lasting a mere 11 minutes. So yeah, this more than likely went underneath your radar. Should you care? Yes, this show is kinda catered towards people who are or might have been part of the Sega fanbase at some point, but it is open to a wider audience thanks to it being a high school slice of life story. But you will miss out on some of the really lovely in-jokes that only a Sega kid will pick up on. But it is still good viewing, especially if you're a video gamer in general. The reason this show left a mark on my heart and why I hold it in such high regard was because it was made entirely out of love for the old brand. Sega Japan brought out the Sega Hard Girls as a means to represent their old selves from days gone by. It was done with complete care and consideration towards their history and it was especially nice to see the company poke fun at itself too, so go and check it out if you can. Since this show is fairly short and focuses entirely around three of the main girls, there really is not much backstory to go on so I'll just give you a quick synopsis on what the show is about and then we'll be on our merry way. Sega Hard Girls follows a tale of three high school girls who attend Sega Gaga Academy and have to earn 100 credit medals in their studies if they want to graduate. The girls themselves are physical embodiments of the three main consoles from Sega. Mega Drive, Sega Saturn, and Dreamcast, who I'll finally be talking about in a minute. Classes are taught to the girls by Mr. Senta Sensei, who is actually voiced by Sega and Sonic Team legend Yuji Naka. Atta boy. Their classes consists of the girls jumping into various Sega game franchises and completing assignments set by Senta Sensei. These range from things like defeating opponents in the game of Virtua Fighter, to skating in the game of Jet Set Radio and dropping some sick tags, yo. Depending on how they do, they'll be awarded a number of credit medals that go towards their graduation target. And that's all you need to know because that's all there is to know. Shall we finally start talking about Dreamcast then, yeah? Yeah, okay, cool, nice one. Visual design. DC's design is based entirely off of the Japanese Dreamcast with the white reflecting the colour of the console and the orange reflecting the colour of the logo in that country. I kinda sorta like to headcanon that Dreamcast has a cousin living in Europe whose outfit is white and blue to reflect our region's version of the console. I'm such a fucking loser. She wears a sleeveless top that shamelessly plasters the face of the console across her chest, along with a few orange swirls thrown in for good measure, just in case you didn't quite figure out who she was yet. Going further down her outfit to the trim of her skirt and you will see part of the skirt's design actually references the four controller ports of a Dreamcast console. Her headgear consists of the Dreamcast control pad, which is what she uses to transform into a full body version whenever she hops into a game world, complete with the magical girl transformation sequence. Because you're fucking with anime now, son. 
she wears her hair in two ponytails that end in swirls, which are also obviously referencing the Dreamcast logo. The hair colour might have a few people scratching their heads as to where the pink tones are coming from, but this is also a nice little reference too. Space Channel 5, a highly praised game that appeared on the Dreamcast console and was considered one of the more successful in-house developed titles for the system. The lead character Ulala was a futuristic news reporter who had pink hair. Our Dreamcast here is a fangirl of Ulala and has pink hair in homage to her. Dreamcast is also the wielder of a sword called the Dream Blade, which uh, kind of looks like one of those toy swords that you get from Toys R Us as a kid, and uh, it makes a delightful noise whenever you swing it around. Magic. Her short hooded poncho is probably my favourite part of her design and when she's waving that dream blade around, these items in combination seem to give Dreamcast somewhat of a noble warrior feel to her. She looks like a knight, ready to set out on a journey across the lands to slay a prick. Can we not mod her into Skyrim or something? Someone get on that. Overall, I like Dreamcast's design as it plays around with the elements of the console in small but neat ways. On first appearance, it might look like it's literally throwing the system at you with such an outward usage of the Dreamcast's front on her shirt, but look elsewhere on the design and you'll start seeing little things that have been included with a bit more thought behind them. Personality. I am very picky over which aloof and zany characters I tend to like. It's not a personality type I usually look forward to when coming into a series, and sometimes characters within this category will have to do a bit of work to win my respect. I say this because Dreamcast is one of those characters. She's clumsy, she talks a lot, and she usually goes off the point when she is talking. Knowing these are the things that turn me off a character, Dreamcast somehow won me over, but how did she do it? Well, that would be because of the reasons for her being this character type in the first place. What was the biggest selling point of the Dreamcast? Aside from the games, why else would people have wanted to own one back then? Give up? Because it came with a modem and internet access. Something that we clearly take for granted nowadays. Seriously, this was the first mainstream console to actively put the internet into the hands of people who might have never had it before. I was one of them. I went from being hentileless to digital pimp in the space of a weekend. No, seriously, that was my old username on the Dreamcast. And I ain't even shamed, but laugh as we will at the internet and all of its silliness, it's this very thing that has built Dreamcast's personality. It's honestly the most convenient and fitting reason for a character to ever be a bit of a weirdo. Dreamcast as a hard girl has access to the internet and can connect to it whenever she likes since she has a modem built in her head, so she spends a lot of her time on there. Uh, only during toll-free hours though. It charges her out the arse during peak time and her family is poor so they can't afford to always access it. Which could be considered a joke in itself, poking fun at everybody receiving tremendously expensive phone bills when they used to use the Dreamcast internet. So, what's Dreamcast being connected to the net got to do with her personality being this way? Well, for starters, she's a gullible character and believes anything she is told no matter how far-fetched or incorrect it is. This is taken from the fact that online, anybody can pass off anything as fact and people can be tricked into believing utter garbage. She also talks a lot, which is taken from the fact that our internet has become the greatest achievement in communication since the telephone was invented. She talks a lot because the internet is a place where people talk a lot. Leading off at that point, she can also get sidetracked a bit, which is a shout out to anybody who goes online to do something and then five minutes later they've forgotten what they were supposed to be doing because they've become distracted by everything. Then there's Dreamcast's kinky side. Oh what, you think I'm joking? She's connected to the internet my friend. Think about it. This side of Dreamcast is downplayed a lot because, yo, let's not turn our little anime show into a full-blown porno, but DC is certainly the playful one out of the three. The most obvious moment to take note of is when all three girls have to get changed in the same changing area, and while butt naked behind the curtain, Dreamcast catches sight of a nude Mega Drive and gives her the good old-fashioned one-two gropage. But that's about as far as it ever goes, so don't worry, you won't be watching this show with other people present and suddenly be thrown a sex scene out of nowhere. Because that's what the bloody notorious big movie did, and made my whole family in the room feel fucking awkward as shit. 
Dreamcast's lusty side is honestly hardly noticeable though, but I felt a need to mention it because of her connections to the internet and, you know, the internet being for porn and that and it. Speaking of important things... Important. The Dreamcast was the swan song from Sega's hardware division and is usually held in high regard by critics when considering that legacy. This is portrayed in the show with Dreamcast usually being given the benefit of the doubt and easy win moments. One part that always stuck out to me the most was when Senta Sensei asks each girl to think up a game while incorporating Puyo Puyo elements into it. Dreamcast's first idea was to literally take the Sega game Fantasy Zone and reskin it with Puyo's. A very bland idea indeed, yet Senta Sensei gave a medal to Dreamcast anyway for it and without a reason as to why he done so. It's little things like that which make it seem Dreamcast has it the easiest out of the three, and sometimes she gets special treatment because of her importance as being the last Sega console. While I don't like the slight overtones of favouritism towards the character, as I believe the other two are just as awesome though for different reasons, I can understand why Dreamcast does get this special attention. She is literally the last of her kind. The Seiha Gaga Academy are hoping she'll be able to go out there and deliver one final blast of Sega magic to the world. I guess on those grounds, the show is going to give a little extra attention to Dreamcast. She also creates a strong bond with Sega Saturn and Mega Drive during their time at the Academy, promising to always stay connected to them no matter what the future may hold. Friendships seem to be an important thing to Dreamcast, and so not wanting to lose contact with either of her two friends seems a logical element to the character and the overall theme for the show. Her level of importance is to be expected when all of these things are taken into consideration. And besides, it just wouldn't feel right to have a show about Sega consoles and somehow leave out the Dreamcast from the main lineup. Conclusion. She's a ditzy, silly character whose entire personality is constructed from her being connected to the internet, and I love that concept. A lot of anime shows have this character type, but it can get just a little too samey and similar across all of those different shows. Some characters are just airheads for the sake of being comedic relief, so it was really nice that Sega chose to have Dreamcast be this character type, but bother to think more into why she is this way. Honestly, it's quite admirable the amount of thought that actually went into this tiny little show. The overall direction for the character is something you might not have expected at first, but once you understand it, it becomes very difficult to imagine Dreamcast any other way than this. My only real gripe is that while they might have gotten the character down successfully, 13 small episodes is not enough to satisfy my appetite for a show of this nature, and I've been left wanting to see so much more than what we were given. Dreamcast is a great little character with some great moments, it's just a shame that it was over before I knew it. And I think you'll see me say this for any other Sega Hard Girl that I'll ever review. 13 episodes is just not enough running time for a character with this much thought put into it, and I really honestly hope that Sega are considering a second series.